And the guy came around the corner, and I said, are you following me? And he put his hand on my neck like that. How often do you go to Mexico for the purpose of visiting Patron? Maybe once every couple years. Okay. Uh, and it's mainly because I went down there for a commercial, I go down there for a Christmas party, things of that nature, but not on a regular basis. One, there's no need for me to do it on a regular basis. And two, I, I kind of want to stay out of the limelight. Because when you get really, really known, you go to areas like that, well, you know, there, 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 there could be some stupid people doing dumb things. Right. Like kidnapping you for ransom, things like that. Is security a big concern to you? No, because I have it. Uh -huh. you, well, just to let you know, you've had security at the house there and didn't even know it. Right. Yeah, we, we have it down so well now. I may have like a, a big giant guy there. I know for a while, for a couple of years, I would be overwhelmed in hotels. So I hired for a couple of years, his name is Pee Wee. He's six foot seven and I think he weighed close to 400 pounds, big guy. <laughs> Aren't gonna mess it, with it was the president of the Hells Angels, Los, uh, Sin City, Las okay. Vegas. And then regular security would be, you know, back like 10 feet or something, always with their eye on me, just in case things got out of hand, then right. they would step in, but it, it hasn't. Have you ever had any close calls? Only once, and it was in Las Vegas, only one time. What happened? Uh, uh, some idiot, real idiot. Oh, it was during the days, I think, where we had a little bit more of shall we say, stupid uh, ideology uh, people of uh, the, the Muslim faith. It was one of the hotels, and it was this guy in a suit, uh, but looked a little different. You know, I don't know whether he's Hispanic, whether he was an Arab, what he was, just looked a little different here. And, uh, but he kept on watching me, and I was taking all these pictures in the foyer with these people, and he was kind of in the back, just kind of just looked weird. But I had a feeling the guy was following me. So I just ducked into a bathroom where I knew where it was. It was right before our, our meeting room there. I just ducked in there. And the guy came around the corner and I said, are you following me? And he put his hand on my neck like that. I couldn't believe it. It was like stunned. This is where it's, you know, uh, flee or, or fight. Right. He put it right there and he said, your story is a lie. You Americans all lie. You never started with nothing. And man, I reverted back to my let's say early 20s when maybe I did things I, I regretted, okay? And I just hauled and punched the guy and he went down and I kicked him and punched him again. And then I said, and the guy was still conscious, and I just said to him, no, that's a big fat lie, man. I came from nothing. I don't know what you represent, but people are lying to you. Our country works, get a life. And I walked away. You know, sometimes you get idiots that get carried away with the news and what everyone else is doing. That's just stupid. It's just a stupid It's guy. scary though. It was, yeah, for that was amazing. He put his hand on my neck. I was right. like, whoa. Um, because you just, when you're a public face and everybody. I could be know, seen on no. TV some of the story. Who knows? Just the, the guy was just, you know, misguided, unfortunately. Just very mis And that's why I said, hell, I wish I would have kept Pee Wee with me, you know? But, anyways, right. but it didn't happen. But uh, it's like that's why martial arts and what we do with kids in, uh, in our martial arts team is great because it gives you all that confidence. I wouldn't go after the guy and punch him. I just wouldn't do that. But when someone had my neck, oh my God, I had no second thoughts of you. You're right. going down. No second thoughts. What do you think of uh, Sir Richard? Richard I've known for quite a few years. In fact, I met Richard, I believe the first time uh, going down with Nelson Mandela. When Richard and I and Nelson Mandela agreed to be, and Brad Pitt was with us too. We were gonna be uh, part of Mindseeker where we can remove all the landmarks. We have this new technology and a blimp and do everything. So we all met down, we all were there together. That was right at the time he met Angelique Jolie. And before he met her, obviously afterwards, but uh, it was right at that time. We were all there together with Nelson and we were all talking about how, what we could do good. And Nelson had known him, he'd met him before. And of course, Nelson knew me from before. But that was our, our first show uh, together. And then I saw him a few times after that. Great guy. How about best memory with Nelson Mandela? I'm sitting there with Nelson Mandela and Brad Pitt and, uh, and Richard, and Nelson says, I want to go to work for you, John Paul. I said, Nelson, you're walking around the cane right now. What do you want to do for me? I'd work for you free. He says, I want to be your driver. I said, well, Nelson, I don't have a driver, but if I did have a driver, I'd have to hire a driver to drive you around, to drive me around. He goes, yes, it's okay. <laughs> I said, well, Nelson, why would you want to do anything with me? Like, you're, you're Nelson Mandela, I'm like, come on. He says, because I'm just hanging around right now, he says, digging my own grave, and my wife uh, is becoming very challenging. <laughs> <laughs> cracked up, cracked up on that one. Very funny.
And it was another time, too, uh, we were, I think it was his 90th birthday, and we had a private dinner. And uh, this dinner that we had was only uh, attended by 250 people, period. Clinton was there, Oprah Winfrey, all heads of state, celebrities were there. Uh, and they were all asked, because Nelson was really slowing down then, right? Mm -hmm. They said, please don't ask for pictures with Nelson. Everybody's going to want him because, you know, he can't do with everybody here. So please don't take pictures. Okay, no problem. So anyways, Nelson had never met Eloise. So I went over, I introduced Eloise to Nelson. I said, Nelson, this is Eloise, my wife. You've never met her before. And I've been together many, many times with him, but you never met Eloise. So I, I was a polite gentleman. I wanted to introduce Eloise. And Nelson is you know, kind of a ladies' man, I think, a little bit, even though in his older years. Anyway, so Nelson says, oh, JP, or she te he tells Eloise, did your husband tell you I want to go to work for him? She goes, oh, yes, Nelson, he did. He goes, oh, okay. He says, can we take a picture? Huh. And we go, well, sure, Nelson, after my, he goes, it's okay, it's okay. Okay, you take the one picture, because I want a picture with your wife. <laughs> so it's this phone, same phone, right? Uh -huh. So I turn the phone on, it takes a while to warm us up, so there, everyone is looking, some of them pissed off, right? I'm just trying to get my phone working. Then I, and he's holding her, you know, <laughs> right there. I stab a couple of pictures when we walk off, so that's another Nelson story. He's a great guy. He was a really cool guy. He had a great sense of humor, too, just a fabulous guy. What's your favorite toy? My train. How did the idea for that even come about? When I married Eloise in 1993, we were given a lot of really neat gifts from friends. Dan Aykroyd gave me a case of Bordeaux. Good Bordeaux, like really good Bordeaux from France. Uh, and my friend Isaac Tigrid, who started Hard Rock Cafes and the House of Blues, gave me his train for a couple of weeks. Take it wherever you want, JP, it's my gift to you. Wolfgang Puck gave me one of his sous chefs to be on the train with us to cook for us. So you talk about, wow, right? He fell in love with the train. In 1996, uh, Isaac ran into some financial challenges. I said, Isaac, I'll be the steward of this train for a few years. Get back on your feet. Give me what you owe me, the train's back. And then as it turned out, year after year, he said, oh, JP, the train's yours, you know, just keep it. So I've redone the train. He redid it really beautifully, and I redid it the same way he did, but m made it perfect, similar to what he did. And it's, it's a cool train. Explain what it's like riding around on it. Well, the train was built in 1926, uh, commissioned in 1927. It's <laughs> 90 so feet cool. long. It has three suites an observation car, a dining room. It's done in, uh, oh, same as the House of Blues, you have all these Indian artifacts in there, except for the dining room, which is done old British artifacts. And then uh, the kitchen is very, very modern. And it's like big, going back in history, Truman and uh, Roosevelt both campaigned off this train. It's like being in total luxury and just being cruised around. and. We pay an extra few hundred dollars to be the last car. Uh -huh. We have a back porch. We can sit on the back porch. We have speakers back there. And uh, you'll put goggles on for the dust and just go through uh, America and watching America from the back of a train. Now, many years ago, people's front yards were the tracks. In other words, that was everything. You, your uh -huh. car was parked in front. Around back was your barbecue, your lounge chairs. You watch the trains go by. And you don't know that until you ride a train through uh, different parts of America. How often do you write it? Not that often. You know, I want to do it a lot more, a couple times a year.